it's not so easy to erase. I know it's bad for me to keep remembering. If you can't quite peg Laurie Graham down, you aren't alone. Neither did Louis B. Mayer, who gave Graham her first Hollywood contract and then promptly didn't know what to do with her. Neither did Howard Hughes when he was president of RKO in the 1950s. Of all people, it was Frank Capra who helped shape the dual sides of her natural earthiness when he cast her in his seminal It's a Wonderful Life. Good afternoon, Mr. Bailey. Hello, Violet. Hey, you look good. That's some dress you got on there. What? This old thing? Well, I only wear it when I don't care how I look. As the town floored Violet, Graham is clearly having a blast playing a woman whose coquettishness drives some of the film's funniest moments. But it's Capra's unexpected turn into Pottersville that really foreshadows Graham's status as a film noir icon. In this alternate timeline, Violet's small town cheer is curdled by her years in a town now defined by crime and economic depression. In her brief moments, she displays all the bitterness of being failed by the American dream that defined the genre. What did you say your name was? Ginny, because I'm from Virginia. I sure get tired of it here. What do you work here for then? For laughs, dear, for laughs. Her next role in Crossfire as a similar downtrodden prostitute seems like a natural extension of the Pottersville Violet. I haven't really been dancing in almost two years. Why not? Because I haven't. Why? Because I've been working for a living. The cadence now? of her supporting performance, from the sensuality in her face, to the anger in her voice, to, to the search of hope in her eyes for a better tomorrow, to her body language indicating a deep need for a warm shoulder, is devastating. It earned her an Oscar nomination and was her favorite role. You said something about ever since you came to New York. Where do you come from? Azusa. Azusa, California. Azusa? It's kind of a made-up word. Different letters. They put them together. That's how they got the name. Everything from A to Z. U-S-A. Azusa. I was infatuated with her, but I didn't like her very much. So began director Nicholas Ray's relationship and eventual shotgun marriage to Graham. Their affair on the set of A Woman's Secret resulted in a pregnancy while Graham was still married to her first husband. At 1.30 p.m., Graham's divorce was finalized. At 6.30 p.m., she and Ray were married. And at nightfall, Ray was gambling away all of his money, already resentful at his marriage before it had even begun, dooming it from the start. The straw that broke the camel's back occurred when Ray reportedly walked in on Graham and his 14-year-old son from a previous marriage in a very compromising situation. Isn't love grand? Miss Gray. Good morning, Miss Gray. Please sit down. If Ray instantly regretted attaching himself to Graham personally, it's still made clear by their collaboration in a lonely place that he at least respected her artistically as an actress, insisting that she be cast opposite Humphrey Bogart in his masterpiece of fear and self-loathing in Los Angeles, when Bogart's own wife, Lauren Bacall, couldn't get loaned out from Warner Brothers. What's wrong with you? Nothing you can't fix. Were you interested in Mr. Steele because he's a celebrity? No, not at all. I noticed him because he looked interesting. I like his face. The role of failed actress Laurel Gray is, of course, when seemingly tailor-made for Bacall's cool spikiness and intelligence. But Graham is flawless conveying a woman much older and wiser than her 27 years. Well, go ahead and get some sleep, and we'll have dinner together tonight. We'll have dinner tonight, but not together. Matching Bogart's cynical yeah, barbs beat per beat, cool enough to block his advances, though interested enough just to leave the door open for something more. She's not coy or cute or corny. She's a good guy. I'm glad she's on my side. She speaks her mind, and she knows what she wants. Thank you, sir. But let me add, I also know what I don't want, and I don't want to be rushed. Two people chewed up and spit out by the post-war film industry. Their connection is fueled by genuine desperation for a human connection that's rarely seen in a genre defined by its double crosses and deception. I've been looking for 
someone for a long time. I didn't know her name or where she lived. I'd never seen her before. But a girl was killed, and because of that, I found what I was looking for. Now I know your name, where you live, and how you look. Dick! But it's also a relationship born out of violence. And though In a Lonely Place is often celebrated as one of the best love stories in film noir, it's less heralded as a complex look at being trapped in an abusive relationship. Dick, stop, you kill him! The entire dynamic of the film shifts the moment the Laurel realizes the man she loves is also a violent threat. With Dix's role shifting from the anti-hero to the antagonist, Laurel from the love interest to the protagonist. Graham poignantly captures the denial that frees his abused women from leaving, not wanting to admit that her lover is someone who could hurt her, yet not quite able to ignore all the red flags right in front of her either. And why don't you talk to him? Tell him how you feel. What can I say to him? I love you, but I'm afraid of you. I want to marry you, but first convince me that Lochner's wrong, that you didn't kill Mildred Atkinson. You should go away for a while. I'd really think you should. Filming couldn't have been easy for Graham. Contractually obligated to be directed by her husband without question. Acting opposite a magnetic film star and producer who wanted his own wife in her role. Not to mention the quiet separation of Graham and Ray in the middle of filming. Likewise, it could have been easy even for the humanist filmmaker Ray to turn his movie into a misogynist wet dream against a wife that he hated. In the original ending, Dix kills Laurel in the heat of their climactic argument, turning the woman he loves into a cadaver he's often written into his scripts. The original ending we had written so that it was all tied up into a very neat package, and I thought, oh, shit, I can't do it, I just can't do it. Romances don't have to end that way. Then I kicked everybody off stage except Bogart, Art Smith, and Gloria. And we improvised the ending as it is now. It was only a moment of self-awareness on Ray's parts that completely changed the ending into something that transcends both the conventions of film noir and the production code. Where Laurel lives, but her relationship to Dix is dead. It's a move that ultimately strengthens both characters into people far more complex than mere victim and villain, and deepening the performances into career finest by Bogart and Graham. I lived a few weeks while you loved me. I honestly wonder if Graham thrived filming movies in stressful situations for tyrannical directors. She lay under an elephant's foot for Cecil B. DeMille, and finally, she was one of only a small handful of actors who worked for Fritz Lang more than once. This is, after all, a director who literally pushed Peter Lorre down a flight of stairs to get the performance he was looking for in M, and made poor Jocelyn Branda do over 20 takes because he wanted steak sauce to drip down just the right way. Any weight burdened on her by the numerous takes isn't seen whatsoever in her performance in The Big Heat, as the happily oblivious gangster's mall Debbie Marsh. Oh, well, sure, Mr. Lagina. I always like to tell Vince you're calling. I like to see him jump. Vince! It's him! Graham mines a lot of humor from lines that are more film noir spike than humorous on paper in her early scenes. Her born sexy yesterday energy hiding a bubbling disdain when Lee Marvin tries to put her in her place. Debbie! Shut the door! Both characters make the fatal mistake of believing they can control the other one. Ah! I'll fix you in your pretty face. Oh, Vince, she scolded. She had it coming. The recipient of the film's most memorably violent scene, Debbie also sees the fullest extent of her lover's violence despite her denial. But unlike Laurel Gray, the attack only lunges her into full revenge mode. Rare for a noir heroine, Debbie gets to retain and even finally find her humanity through her friendship with moral cop Dave Banyan. Both fueled in different ways by their losses. She lost her face, he lost a wife. To take down a powerful crime syndicate. 
The film's best moments involve Debbie subtly making Banny remember his wife instead of just compartmentalizing her. What was your wife like, Dave? 27 years old, light hair, gray eyes. That's a police description. Did she like to cook, like to be surprised? What kind of things made her laugh? That's what... The investigation may drive the plot forward, but make no mistake. Debbie is the heart of the big heat, at once the vengeful femme fatale and then the saint, sacrificing herself for all the sins that Banny didn't have the courage to commit by himself. The rest of Graham's output to a most profligate decade include numerous contributions to film noir that had her falling a lot more easily into the sensual femme fatale archetype, including her second film with Fritz Lang, Human Desire. Like most great stars of the Golden Age, she won an Oscar for one of her least effective roles and performances in The Bad and the Beautiful. She played the girl who couldn't say no in Oklahoma. And just as the 50s ended, so did Graham. She just stopped. She never had another great film role after the 50s, popping up on TV or a B-horror movie or exploitation movie. What you call death may maybe only the temporary absence of life. You're a witch! Even gaining a tiny role in Melvin and Howard, where the irony surely wasn't lost on her that she was still living in the shadow of Howard Hughes after all these years. Even if her career quietly went into the night before her death in 1981, Graham still left a burn mark on celluloid history. Are you interested? Well, I would have to see it, of course. <laughs> You are seeing it. It was a conscious decision for Annette Benning to take notes from the big heat when playing a con artist in The Grifters. Benning nails not just the physicality that made Graham such an icon, but also her natural knack for verbally splintering people. Oh. Oh, of course. Now that I see you in the light, you're plenty old enough to be Roy's mother. Hell, even a dress that she wears is a replica of Graham's from the hotel scene of The Big Heat. Her impression of Graham and Stephen Freer's neo-noir is a solid foreshadowing of how she would depict the real woman in film stars don't die in Liverpool. Not a carbon copy by any physical means, but carefully capturing her youthful flirtiness, softening the femme fatale infamy the press had given her, yet still alluding to the volcano underneath still waters. Has anyone ever told you you look like Lauren Bacall when you smoke? Yeah, Humphrey Bogart. There's con men and there's boosters. Graham once said that even though she remembered every detail of her Hollywood career, she only wanted to remember the images, not the details. When I think of Graham, I remember the image of her eyes, the way a few darts could size up a man with dazzling intimacy and curiosity, and the slightest raise of her eyebrows could chop down even the most masculine of co-stars. You want to bite somebody? Yeah. Well, pick your spot. Even when she wasn't in focus of a shot, her eyes were clearly doing all the listening and thinking where most actresses only react. That was the essence of Gloria Graham. Poignant, smart, and nobody's fool. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's the race in the hole. They'll tell you of trips that they're going to take. From Frisco up to the North Pole. But their name would be mud like a chump stealing stuff if they.